Section 1. In this section, you will hear a conversation between a woman and the librarian. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see. Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear. We just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm, perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Well, what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh, yes, how silly of me. I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, oh, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. OK. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine. Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of $5 in case you damage them. But that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh, and how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh dear. We're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now? Mm, I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 7 to 10. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C-O-O-P-E-R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on 723-6518. But it's better after 5 p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's 25 St. Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H-A-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G5798-0942. OK, and your ticket is ready. The number is M930123. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like. That is the end of section one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear an introduction on cheese making. You have half a minute to read the questions 11 to 20 first. Now listen to the monologue carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Cheese is one of those foods that we tend to take for granted as always having been with us. And it's odd to think that someone somewhere must have discovered the process to make cheeses. That takes place today. In the studio to tell us all about it is Monica Maxwell. Today we all know that the process of making cheeses takes place when microorganisms get into milk and bring about changes in its physical and biochemical structure. Well, obviously, we don't know who discovered the process, but it's thought that it came from Southwest Asia about 8,000 years ago. In the early time, there were mainly two types of cheeses. One of them was rather tasteless and bland in the case of the so-called fresh cheeses, which are eaten immediately after the milk has coagulated. And another one was rough-tasting and salty in the case of the ripened cheeses, which are made by adding salt to the soft fresh cheese and allowing other biochemical processes to continue so that a stronger taste and a more solid texture resulted. The ancient Romans changed all that. They were great pioneers in the art of cheese making, and the different varieties of cheese they invented and the techniques for producing them spread with them to the countries they invaded. This spread of new techniques took place between about 60 BC and 300 AD. You can still trace their influence in the English word cheese, which comes ultimately from the Latin word Cassius, that's C-A-S-E-U-S. -E At this stage in history, people weren't aware in a scientific way of the role of different microorganisms and enzymes in producing different types of cheese. But they knew from experience that cheese's tastes were relevant to something. If you kept your milk or your pre-cheese mixture at a certain temperature or in a certain environment, things would turn out in a certain way. In the 19th century, with the increasing knowledge about microorganism, there came the next great step forward in cheese making. Once it was known exactly which microorganism was involved in the different stages of producing a cheese and how the presence of different microorganisms affected the taste, it was possible to introduce them deliberately and to industrialize the process. Nowadays, cheese is made on a large scale in factories, although the small producer working from his dairy farm continued to exist and still exists today. Cheese making moved very much into the world of technology and industrial processes, although because the aim is still to produce something that people like to eat, there's still an important role for human judgment. People still go round tasting the young cheese at different stages to see how it's getting on, and may add a bit of this or that to improve the final taste. Whatever the scale of production, there is still room for the development of art alongside the technology. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section three. In this section, you will hear a conversation between John Watson and several environmental science students. Now you have half a minute to read the questions twenty-one to thirty. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to thirty. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our guest to you, John Watson. We're delighted to have John with us today to share his views on conservation. As environmental science students, I know you'll have a lot of questions, so let's kick off by asking him to tell us how he got involved in the environmental movement. Thank you, Deborah. It's nice to be here. When I was seven years old, back in the 1940s, my father bought 200 acres of land on the central coast of New South Wales in eastern Australia. The marvelous thing about it was that it was virgin bush, in other words, completely natural. But this kind of country doesn't exist any more. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. We went to live there when I was ten. When I was twelve, the foxes and cats appeared, and by the time I was fourteen, there were no native animals left. You mean that within four years, all the native animals had gone? That's exactly what I mean. But it took a while for people to realize what was going on. So you're saying that it was the cat and the fox that killed off the native animals? Absolutely right. But back in the 1970s, people didn't realize it. Even though Australia was losing wildlife faster than the rest of the world combined, people were blaming the farmers and miners, but not their lovely little pussy cats. The domestic cats you're talking about? Exactly. And what's more, they didn't want to know. Can you tell us how you set about proving your theory that it was feral cats and foxes which were killing native animals? Well, I moved to South Australia specifically to set up a wildlife sanctuary there. Why South Australia in particular? I chose South Australia because it was the only state where it was still legal for me to fence off an area and put back locally extinct animals. That was very far-sighted of them, wasn't it? Well, not exactly. They just hadn't got around to making it illegal, though they soon tried to once they realised what I was doing. Did you ever get into trouble for your actions? <laughs> yes, once or twice. In 1976, they put me in jail for cutting down some pine trees to allow me to build a fence to keep out the cats and foxes. How did you get out of that situation? Well. I signed an agreement saying that I wouldn't go on building the sanctuary, but then I just kept on building it. That was very brave of you. <laughs> well, I figured that I had signed under duress, so I didn't feel bound by it. The sanctuary was completed in 1983 and opened to the public in 1985, and within a year, it was overrun with native animals. There are other ways of protecting endangered animals, though, aren't there? You can raise public awareness through research and educational programs. Well, I don't have much time for that. Unfortunately, today we measure success in science not by your results, but by how much funding you get. What you've done is obviously admirable. But don't you think there is an argument for letting nature take its course? I mean, don't you think cats and foxes have a right to live too? Well, no, not really. They were introduced to this country, but they don't belong here. But aren't you trying to turn back the clock? These other animals are here now. What is so important to you about native species that justifies killing any number of alien ones? I believe that evolution gave us a paradise. And that we will lose everything unless we understand the need for balance. But really, at the end of the day, it's just a belief. It's just a feeling. That is the end of section three.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. In this section, you will hear a lecture on the research on teen brain. Now you have half a minute to read the questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today our guest is Joseph Parks, medical director for the Botany Department of Mental Health. He's going to give a lecture about the research on teenage brain. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to introduce the new research about adolescent mind, the teenage brain. How much do you know about that? Do you believe in brain scanning? Do you think we can judge whether a teen is normal or mentally ill, or it's just another immature test? The new research shows a teen brain is in the middle of disordered changes. Those changes, scientists now believe, are so significant that they may reveal the mysteries of mental illness, explaining why some teens commit suicide, why others harm their classmates, and why some emerge later in life with mental disorders. The research looks forward to a day when teens could be tested for suicidal depression as easily as they are for heart disease. But there are signs that society and parents, in particular, would reject such a tool. Many parents question the validity of a mental health diagnosis. They fear that their children will be falsely tagged with a mark that he or she is abnormal. At the center of the debate is the teen brain, its confusing architecture, and the difficult question of what's typical in a teen and what's not. Under the old thinking, the adolescent brain was fully formed, needing only to be filled with facts, figures, and experiences to become an adult mind. At the same time, many people rejected the idea that young people were even capable of developing mental illnesses. However, the new research shows a teenage brain is an organ in transition. It has an unstable and vulnerable composition. The evolving teenage brain clearly isn't adult-like until the early twenties. If teens act young and stupid, it may be because brain areas that govern rational thought are not mature yet. All that is fine when the brain develops normally, but if the teen brain fails to successfully reinvent itself as an adult brain, mental illness may happen. Researchers increasingly believe if that process stops for some reason. Teens are likely to develop mental illness. Early warning signs might be disregarded, as adults may think them the typical teen behaviors. Perhaps the chief hope of the new research is that it could make a difference for teenagers suffering from mental disorder and major depression. These can lead to suicide, which for years has been the leading cause of death for teens. Until recently, scientists couldn't peer into living brains to look for changes associated with normal development or mental diseases. That is beginning to change as researchers develop ever more sensitive brain scanners. However, the composite pictures are somewhat misleading. A snapshot of an individual brain may fall somewhere between normal and mentally ill. For now, psychiatrists and psychologists must still rely on interviews and observations of children's behavior to diagnose mental illness. That is the end of section four.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.